Nu China mee gaat knallen in de economische groeiexplosie... waarin de wereld verkeert, komt een brandend probleem naar voren. Afval. Hergebruik en recycling werken maar zeer ten dele. Maar er is een revolutionair nieuw idee. In tegenlicht een schets van een wereld waarin afval voedsel wordt... en de consument geen vervuiler meer is. Utopie of werkelijkheid? Tegenlichtprogrammamaker Rob van Hattem ging op onderzoek. China groeit in hoog tempo. De komende jaren moeten op het platteland zo'n 200 miljoen huizen gebouwd worden. Doen ze dat met bakstenen, dan kost dat 25% van de toplaag van de landbouwgronden... en de helft van de kolenvoorraden om die stenen te bakken. China heeft een groot probleem. Ford Motor Company heeft ook een probleem. Wat doe je als je 80 jaar lang auto's hebt gemaakt en je productieterrein een van de grootste en meest vervuilde industrieparken ter wereld is geworden? Wat doet Nike als de hoeveelheid schoenen die ze over de aarde verspreiden zo groot is dat het een afvalprobleem begint te worden? Een textielfabrikant heeft een probleem wanneer hun afval als chemisch gevaarlijk wordt gezien... en de overheid verbiedt het te storten of te verbranden. Eigenlijk hebben we allemaal een probleem. Wat doen we met snel groeiende economieën, met een hoog consumptiepatroon... met afnemende grondstofvoorraden en met bergen afval? Het lijkt op economische waanzin. If you look at the waste, it's really a very bad business proposition. Because why should anybody make anything that has no value or has a cost? So I think the fundamental transformation will actually occur because of economic forces. It won't be because of some moral issue or some technical revelation. It'll be because waste is basically stupid. Een Amerikaanse architect en een Duitse chemicus ontketenen een industriële revolutie die de komende jaren als een ecologische storm door het bedrijfsleven zal razen. Hun voorbeeld is de natuur, waar afval geen probleem is, omdat afval voedsel is. Voedsel voor groei. In het Zwitserse Rijndal ligt een oude textielfabriek, Kroner. Begin jaren 90 stond het bedrijf voor de keuze. Verhuizen of een oplossing vinden voor hun afvalprobleem. Toenmalig CEO Elbin Kalin wist niet hoe hij dat probleem moest oplossen. We willen het waste waste-probleem get rid of the waste in een more adequate way. We wanted to use the waste that we produced at the mill. We wanted to burn that at the mill to save oil. And the officials came and they said, you're not allowed to do this. And we have made a lot of studies and there was just a dead end road for us. Hun textielafval werd beschouwd als zwaar chemisch afval. Een collega van Kaelin kende een Amerikaanse architect ontwerper, William McDonough, die wellicht een oplossing had. Kaelin liet hem overkomen en haalde hem op van het vliegveld. And at, during this drive from Zurich Airport to Herbrook, where the mill was located, William McDonald told me waste equals food. And it made click. If we can make our waste to be food, we can solve all the problems. Maak het afval volkomen onschadelijk voor mens, plant en dier. Ofwel, maak het textiel volledig biologisch afbreekbaar. Dat was de oplossing. Maar hoe doe je dat met de kunststofgarens en de zwaar giftige kleurstoffen die Ronen gebruikte? Op aanraden van de Amerikaanse ontwerper liet Kaling de Duitse chemicus Michael Browngard naar deze problemen kijken. And I was really very nervous. Because Michael Browngard had a Greenpeace uh, 
history. And as an uh, industrialist, uh, I was uh, to let someone, a former Greenpeace activist, into the mill, uh, you don't feel so easy. Braungart mocht dan wel Greenpeace activist zijn geweest. Hij was toevallig ook de beste ecologische chemicus ter wereld. Er begon een zoektocht naar sterke natuurlijke garens. De keuze viel op een combinatie van katoen en rami, een stevige plantenvezel. Maar een bijna onoverkomelijk probleem bleek de giftigheid van de kleurstoffen. And we tried to contact all dichemical manufacturers. Uh, around the world and we wanted that they present all the details of environmental safe products and all of them said we are not going to work with you we are not going to open our books uiteindelijk vonden ze het chemisch bedrijf Siba Gaiki bereid om mee te denken een zoektocht tussen 1600 verschillende kleurstoffen begon ze hielden slechts 16 kleurstoffen over die totaal onschadelijk waren en waarmee ze elke gewenste kleur konden maken. Roner kon nu hoogwaardig composteerbaar textiel maken dat onder meer gebruikt wordt voor de bekleding van vliegtuigstoelen. Het probleem van Roner was opgelost. Van het textielafval maakt de fabriek vilt dat verkocht wordt aan de lokale boeren. Die gebruiken het om in de winter hun aardbeien af te dekken. Het vilt composteert volledig en is daarmee voedsel voor de planten. Ook het afvalwaterprobleem uit de fabriek was gelijk opgelost. Het komt nu schoner de fabriek uit dan het erin gaat. Kelin was om. Hij was voorgoed een adept van de Duitse chemicus en de Amerikaanse ontwerper. It changed uh, my life. Really changed my life. Because it's such an easy solution. And no one actually thought of it before in this way. And I have been discussing it with a lot of people before, with technicians, engineers, uh, people from other industries. And they're all stuck in the end, dead end road. And this for me, this was a solution. Het verhaal van Roner begint in New York. William McDonough is ontwerper en architect. Hij moest in 1991 een crash bouwen en wilde geen giftige bouwstoffen gebruiken. Iemand zei dat hij eens moest gaan praten met die Duitse chemicus Michael Brungard. Ik had hem gehoord als de meest belangrijke ecologische toxicologist die ik kon that I could meet. Yeah, when I first met Bill McDonough, it was when I was opening an office of my institute in New York. So I went to the opening party. Bill McDonough came half hour earlier. I was the first one there. We had a real nice place in the East Village. We sat on a rooftop above Greenwich Village in New York, looking down on the street at the taxis and up at the skyscrapers. And we opened the office and all the European community uh, from companies like Exo or Um, DSM from the Netherlands, etc. They passed by and came in. And we started talking, and, and we talked the whole party through. I think he ignored everybody else. And basically, I missed the whole uh, opening because I was talking only to him. And we stayed till it was dark, and, and all the people came by from UNICEF or United Nations and said hello. And I said hello, good. And I continued talking to Bill McDonald because it was so interesting and talking to him and sharing ideas, etc. I just started to imagine what if the vehicles were different? What if the bottles that we drank out of were different? What if our shoes were different? What if our clothes were different? What if the buildings were different? What, what would it all look like? And we just started imagining the future. McDonough and Braungart let elkaar niet meer los. Ze richten samen een bedrijf op voor intelligente productsystemen. When I first said waste equals food, we were talking about the, the overall approach to what he called intelligent product system. And the intelligent product system says that everything in biology should go back to soil safely and be healthy. So the waste of a system that would go back to soil 
you know, like this. This may not get recycled, but this could be compostable, right? That should be safe and healthy. So waste equals food. We are the only ones who take materials and put them into landfills. So we make waste. And even when we try to minimize waste, like zero emissions or zero waste, we still accept the concept of waste. Yeah? So what we do is we eliminate the concept of waste. Yeah? For us, we design everything that it's a nutrient, yeah? and either for biological system or for technical system. So it's beneficial. So uh, we look at a cherry tree in spring and say, look, what a waste of energy, what a waste of, of materials. But every material of this cherry tree is beneficial. Every material becomes a nutrient, goes back in a biological cycle. And the more blossoms from the cherry tree are there, the better it is. So we generate systems which are beneficial. And in this case, we say waste equals food. Yeah? Not like McDonald's, where food equals waste. Yeah? It is different. We go there and look that every material is beneficial. Yeah? And so that the more waste we have, waste in brackets, the better it is. Yeah? So it's not about like clean or production or that. Yeah? Nature is only productive when it's dirty, when it's sludge. Yeah? When the more sludge, the better. Yeah, not clean, not not uh, Mr. Clean, not not this American housewife perspective of the early 50s. Yeah, to make it all clean. No, it's only productive when it really generates space and life for the others. Ja, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, wir Directeur Groep van het Duitse kledingbedrijf Trigema kondigde onlangs op een persconferentie trots zijn nieuwste product aan. Michael Brangard ontwikkelde voor hem volledig composteerbare gifvrije t-shirts. De t-shirts zijn een typisch product van de Brangard en McDonough filosofie. Houd tijdens de ontwerpfase rekening met het moment dat een product weggegooid wordt en zorg ervoor dat een product dan grondstof wordt voor een nieuw product. De composteerbare t-shirts zijn grondstof voor de natuur, de biosfeer. Niet afbreekbare materialen zouden voedsel moeten zijn voor de technosfeer, alle technische producten om ons heen. Het boek Cradle to Cradle, waarin Brangard en McDonough hun ideeën uiteenzetten, is een mooi voorbeeld van een product dat hergebruikt zou kunnen worden in de technosfeer. Het boek is van plastic en dus waterproof. Het is bedrukt met inkt die er vanaf gaat als je het warm maakt. Het plastic is weer hersmeltbaar, zodat er nieuwe boeken van gemaakt kunnen worden. Dat klinkt gewoon als recycling, maar er is toch een subtiel verschil. Well, we don't really recycle products, that's the problem. We downcycle products. Products typically lose their quality as they go through recycling. They're not recycled, they're downcycled. So typically what would happen is something like this would become plastic wood or, you know, some park bench or flower pot or something on its way to a landfill or an incinerator. So it's losing its quality as it goes. What we're looking at is things that are truly recycled, so they go back to their condition or come back to the system and actually get upcycled, where if it's a, if it's a suboptimal material, uh, you know, if the inks aren't ideal or the, or the additives aren't perfect, you know, we can actually purify the product when it comes back through the system. Like if you look at a plastic bottle you know, for water, it has antimony, a carcinogenic heavy metal, as a residue from catalytic reaction. Well, we can take out the antimony when it comes back and make it better. So it upcycles rather than put it in a park bench and mess it up with other chemicals and then burn it. So um, it's, a, it's, it's a subtle distinction. De ideeën van Brangard en McDonough klinken haast utopisch, maar ze worden zeer serieus genomen door grote fabrikanten. In Beaverton, een buitenwijk van Portland, ligt de Nike World Campus, het hoofdkwartier van Nike Worldwide. John Hoke is hoofdschoenenontwerper van Nike. Hij heeft de boodschap goed begrepen. Schoenen worden doorgaans niet gegeten, maar ze slijten wel. En dat komt in de biosfeer. 
Well, I think we have to think about the chemical compounds of the, the, the product itself, because the theory would be that as you're using the shoe, it's, it's eliminating and rubbing off the material and then getting into the ground and worms are eating it. And so I think we have to start with the, the chemical makeup of all the materials that we had. And so from there, I think we'd think about the, the design for disassembly at some point where you can collect the product back and reclaim every single aspect of the shoe and every piece of material and then reuse that in some way to create new product. We have to go back to the source vendors and tell them our goal is that this material is to be food for something somewhere. And so reducing and eliminating all the toxics. Nike neemt het afval is voedselconcept serieus en heeft zichzelf een doel gesteld. Geen afval meer in 2020. Een eerste stap is een reuse a shoe program. Nike is op bescheiden schaal begonnen met het terugnemen van gebruikte schoenen. Het rubber wordt van de schoenen gesneden en hergebruikt. The, the design for disassembly would be key because once we take the shoes back, making the design easy to take apart and to get back to its componentry and raw materials is, is a big constraint. Nu blijft er een soort rubber granulaat over dat gebruikt wordt als toplaag voor hardlooptracks, tennis en basketbalvelden. Maar dat is nog maar een begin, want uiteindelijk zou al het afval van de schoenen weer grondstof moeten zijn voor nieuwe schoenen. Volledig recyclebare schoenen die niets vervuilen, dat is het ideaal. Sinds kort maakt Nike een product dat er aardig op begint te lijken. We are proud of a shoe line we call Nike Considered. And considered design is a philosophy of design that asks our design staff to look at the entire life cycle of a shoe and design with less toxics, using the power of geometry over chemistry, using more natural fibers and materials that are recyclable or, or farmed products. And Nike Considered has uh, been in the marketplace for a bit, uh, has done very well for us. The consumers seem to like it. I happen to be wearing a shoe right here, and I will just talk a little bit about what the shoe does and why we're so proud of it. As I mentioned, it is a, a considered product, so you can see on the inside of the shoe itself, it's just one piece of leather with no foaming, no backing. Uh, we've tried to reduce as many toxics as possible out of the product. It uses raw natural hemps and materials uh, to create the upper itself. And one of the most powerful things about this considered opportunity is that we've reduced as much as possible all the adhesives. And so typically a glue adhesive puts the outsole onto the shoe itself. In this case, we've studied geometry and created a powerful geometry that snap fits the outsole to the upper itself. And this is stitched down with a thread. So we're, we're eliminating as many adhesives as we possibly can. And so the inside itself, from a disassembly perspective, if I were to take this whole thing apart, this just snaps into two units, the inside unit and the outside unit. The threads are taken off, and this goes right back into uh, a, a stream of materials that can be used for a post-secondary life. Het klinkt allemaal mooi, maar kun je er uiteindelijk ook een normaal winstgevend product van maken? I think we can, yes. I think that the waste is food principle is, again, it's a, a very provocative idea. I, I think it's, it's not just an idea of design and creation. It's an idea of business, that there is a limit to raw materials, that we recognize that. And when, as we assemble new products, thinking about the, the business proposition of how you can use products and raw materials on products for a certain lifetime and then have those raw materials turn into something else it is a profit engine. McDonough and Brungard stellen zich een wereld voor waarin letterlijk al het afval voedsel is voor de biosfeer of voor de technosfeer. Op die manier hoeven we ons nooit meer schuldig te voelen over de consumptie van producten en het afval dat dat oplevert. Immers Afval bestaat dan niet meer. 
Here we celebrate abundance. We can throw things away, we can litter, we can enjoy littering, we can use materials back into cycles. Right now we lose about four to six thousand times, four thousand to six thousand times more topsoil than we rebuilt. Yeah? Because our agriculture doesn't work, it doesn't rebuild soil. Yeah? Our ways, we take things and we don't put them back into biological cycles anymore. So what we say, no, let's be productive and be happy to have materials to go put them back. But everything is a nutrient. So the more materials we have, the more we waste in brackets, yeah, the better it is for the others. Yeah? Like we developed, for example, for Unilever, yeah, which is a Dutch company, um, an ice cream packaging, which is not just biodegradable. Biodegradable is just the minimum. Yeah? I am biodegradable, you are biodegradable. Yeah? But so what? Yeah? That's just the minimum, like sustainable. Yeah? But there it starts. We, we, this ice cream packaging is, is, this film is a liquid at room temperature. It's only a film when it's frozen. Yeah? Then you take it out, out of the freezer, yeah, rip it off and you throw it away. It, it becomes a liquid within hours and it degrades within hours. Yeah? But it only, it's not only biodegradable, it contains seeds from rare plants. So when you throw it away, yeah, you generate life, yeah? like the others as well. All the songbirds, etc. They, they, they take the seeds and, and, and all the berries and they generate life by that. Yeah? And, they, and all their excrements and the materials as well generate life. Only we take things and don't give anything back. Um, well, as an architect, you know, I, I come from the larger scale production. Michael, as a chemist, comes from very small scale production. So you put the two of us together and our work can range from the molecule up to regional and city planning and everything in between. So, you know, I design factories where this kind of work gets done. And we try and solar power them and cover them with photosynthetic materials. And, you know, we like to see a building like a tree where it makes oxygen and sequesters carbon, fixes nitrogen, distills water, purifies the air, uh, changes colors with the seasons, creates microclimates. I mean, why wouldn't you want to do that too? Produceren en consumeren zonder afval. Gebouwen die de natuur nadoen, die wil dat niet. McDonough is inmiddels een beroemdheid geworden. Hij kreeg een prijs uit de handen van Bill Clinton... en werd door Time Magazine uitgeroepen tot Hero for the Planet. Zijn natuurlijke en energievriendelijke gebouwen trekken wereldwijd de aandacht. Uh, this one over here, um, for example, produces more energy than it needs to operate. Uh, these are solar collectors on the roof, and this is a waste treatment plant that uses natural systems for the water treatment. So the sun shines on this roof, you can see it here again, and then it causes more energy over the course of a year than the building needs, uh, along with the solar collectors in the parking lot. and then. The wastewater is taken through this greenhouse into this pond and purified. So the building is like a tree. Vlakbij Lake Michigan liggen de fabrieken van Herman Miller. Het bedrijf is al decennia lang een van s werelds bekendste fabrikanten van designmeubels. Een aantal van hun ontwerpen zijn inmiddels opgenomen in museumcollecties. Het bedrijf staat bovenaan in de top 100 van de beste bedrijven van het blad Fortune. Begin jaren 90 ontwierp McDonough hun montagehal. Het gebouw werd de Greenhouse genoemd en was onmiddellijk een doorslaand succes. Een gebouw waarin daglicht de overhand heeft en natuurlijke luchtcirculatie de airco vervangt. Het nieuwe gebouw had vanaf de eerste dag zijn effect op de werknemers. In their old plant, um, it wasn't a great environment, and we actually had more than our fair share of general industrial relations problems in that plant. And you always wonder, you know, well, what's going on? Why was that plant particularly difficult? When we brought the folks into this building, into the greenhouse, um, they responded amazingly well to it. Uh, put simply, the building respects the people who are inside it. 
they became positive, more productive, we have less absenteeism, and indeed we bring all our customers through this building and we actually take them out onto the production floor and let them meet the people working out there because they are just so positive. And it's a great example of when you build a building that really respects individuals, gives them light, gives them the space, gives them the air quality they need, they respond doubly in terms of their commitment to the organization. De filosofie van McDonough beperkt zich niet tot de binnenkant van het gebouw. In zijn visie moet een gebouw geen vijand van de natuur zijn, maar juist een onderdeel daarvan. Het afvalwater gaat naar de vennen op het terrein waar alle ruimte is voor planten en dieren. Het is in de Verenigde Staten de standaard geworden voor groene gebouwen. McDonough wist Herman Miller ook over te halen om hun producten onder de loep te nemen. Inmiddels maakt het bedrijf stoelen volgens het zogeheten cradle-to-cradle concept. Het strikte productieprotocol van McDonough en Brownguard. This chair is one good example. It's called the uh, Mira. And the Mira is a chair that was really the first product that used the cradle-to-cradle protocol. It's a product that's easily disassembled. It, we actually evaluated all the various materials in this chair. And I think there's only a couple materials in here that still have the red designation, which means that there's still something wrong with them in a um, environmental sense. And some of that could be, let's say, a recycled steel part. It might have chrome in it yet, so that would make it red. And we, you know, you, not much you can do about that. But things like this plastic back, we actually had the supplier of this plastic take out the materials that were harmful to the environment. And to, even though it's still this flexible, we took out the things that were not so kind to the environment that also made it flexible. We just used the more natural ones. Het cradle-to-cradle protocol kent strikte eisen. Zijn de materialen voorkomen veilig voor mens en dier? Zijn de materialen later opnieuw te gebruiken in de biosfeer of in de technosfeer? Is een product makkelijk en snel uit elkaar te halen? Interesting, yes, the chair comes completely apart. It takes about 15 minutes for one person. And there isn't a, a joint or a place where it's actually assembled that takes longer than 15 seconds. So each part can come apart. And there are some, a few pieces like this arm pad that is a mixture. And that mixture can also come apart very quickly and very easily for disassembly into its various component parts and then peel the foam off and so again nothing more than 15 seconds for the chair to come apart so it makes it easy then to capture those materials for their next life as the name cradle to cradle implies when you think about it clearly uh, part of our criteria for a cradle to cradle product is that it can be disassembled quickly actually Disassembling something quickly saves us lots of money, right? It's much, much more effective and actually makes it easier to assemble it in the first place. So these criteria don't just become a burden to your business, they actually become an enabler of a better product and a more effective product for us. Het cradle-to-cradle protocol klinkt gewoon als duurzaam ontwerpen. Toch is het veel omvattender. Yeah, uh, sustainability is not enough for us. Yeah. Because if I would ask you, how is your relationship with your girlfriend, yeah? and you would say, sustainable, yeah? then I would say, oh, Rob, I'm so sorry for you. Yeah? If this is uh, the, the key thing, sustainability, yeah, then it's just the minimum. Yeah? You can somehow deal with it. Yeah? It's just maintenance. Yeah? No, sustainability is the minimum, and from there it starts. Our design assignment has two characteristics. One is an emotional one, and one is a technical one. Our emotional one is how do we design systems that love all the children of all species for all time? And that's a very emotional connection. It's about love and in celebration of the natural world and, and the accrual of more and more species, not the destruction of species. And I think it's time that people can become native to this planet, yeah? that they can say, hey, isn't it good that I'm here? Yeah? And we can make the other species on this planet happy that we are here. Yeah? And so this means we develop things which are not less bad, but which are good for the others, yeah? which are supportive, which generate uh, more life than just uh, being less bad. Yeah? Less bad is no good. Yeah? It means 
that we are defining environmental protection like destroying a little less. Yeah? Like to say, oh, I don't use my car today, so I'm protecting the environment. There's no protection with that. Yeah? It's, a, it's an abuse of the term protection, yeah? Yeah, because to destroy a little less doesn't protect anything. The goal is very simple and technical, and the goal is a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, soil, water, and power, economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed, period. Langs de rivier de Rouge in Detroit ligt een van de grootste en oudste industrieparken ter wereld, Fort Rouge Center. Het is de thuishaven van Ford Motor Company. Het is de plek waar de eerste Ford van de lopende band rolde. Tachtig jaar lang werden er auto's gebouwd. Tachtig jaar lang werd er niet gekeken naar de omgeving, de natuur of de rivier. De vervuiling was enorm en Ford stond voor de keuze. Of het terrein verlaten of renoveren. Bill Ford besloot het industriepark te vernieuwen. Het moest schoner worden. Hij kreeg het advies om eens te gaan praten met Bill McDonough. I have heard Bill Ford tell the story that uh, he was reluctant to do so. You know, you get introduced a lot of people that supposedly have the magic solution to these issues. And uh, so they just set a 30 minute meeting uh, to get acquainted with one another. Largely, you know, I'm sure he thought it was going to be a courtesy meeting. Well, that 30 minute meeting turned into several hours and ultimately turned into the assignment to apply his theories to the Ford Rouge Center. Well, when I met Bill Ford, it was more that he convinced himself than I convinced him. He was already prepared to look for a way to do something positive. Um, the commission to do the River Rouge, which is a $2 billion project with a 20-year schedule, was uh, given to me in public uh, without my knowledge. Uh, and I think it was because that way uh, the company was committed to it and I was committed to it and even though it looked impossible um, we just were stuck you know and so we had to produce shareholder value or we were both in trouble so uh, that was the assignment and that's what we did. In 2000 werd de eerste paal geslagen voor de renovatie van het Roos Center. Today we're, we're unveiling the uh, Heritage Project, the environmental renovation of the Rouge. The goal of the Heritage Project is to transform the icon of 20th century manufacturing into the model of 21st century sustainable manufacturing. Het park werd voor 2 miljard dollar gerenoveerd volgens de ideeën van Michael Browngard en Bill McDonough. Ideeën waar men bij Ford erg aan moest wennen. You know, I, I was really honestly emotionally moved by uh, Bill and Michael. Uh, you know, when you first meet them, you know, they look a little kooky. You know, certainly due to an American businessman. You know, I met Bill McDonough and, and he's heard this story before. He was wearing a bow tie and a cape and a beret. And, you know, it's not at all what you meet in a very, you know, this is how we look <laughs> at Ford Motor Company. Uh, and he was an architect from the University of Virginia, and Michael was this chemist from Germany uh, that used to be in Greenpeace. So, you know, your initial reaction is, of course, you know, these guys are nothing but trouble, and they're going to be, you know, oh my God, why do I have to work with them? Bill's objective for us was we want this to be a site where you would be happy to have your children play. Now, you know, in the beginning, what, you know, we don't even know how to deal with this. What the heck kind of an objective is that? How do we measure it? Uh, does that make any sense? Uh, but as I began to think about it, I, I said to myself, you know, I have kids. And I, I would say, no, I don't want my children to play here. And my guess is virtually any parent would give that same answer. Well, now I've got a site with wetlands, green space, wildlife, honeybees. And I think I could take the same parents, including me, and ask them the same question and get a yes answer. So in reality, that was a business-like objective, and it was measurable. Uh, we didn't think of it that way when we first heard about it. The Rouge site werd omgevormd tot een soort industrieel natuurpark, net als bij Herman Miller. Het afvalwater van het hele terrein wordt op natuurlijke wijze gezuiverd. 
Er wordt gebruik gemaakt van zonne-energie. De nieuwe fabriekshal werd gebouwd met veel ramen, zodat er zonlicht naar binnen viel. Het hele productieproces is opgeschoond en er wordt overal naar afvalstromen gekeken. Het dak van de nieuwe productiehal is één groot weiland. Bedekt met sedum zuivert het regenwater en geeft het vogels een nieuwe woonplaats. Allemaal heel mooi en natuurlijk. Maar de meeste businessmanagers zullen het zien als een overdreven vorm van ecoluxe. Well, that's because they see it as a cost. They, they presume that each one of these things adds to the cost of regular production and that they're just icing on a cake or, or a cake instead of bread. You know, and, and that's utopian. But it's not. Because if you look at our production facility for Ford Motor Company, we saved Ford $35 million doing it this way. What we found is if you think about it in the design stage, you can come up with environmental programs that actually save you money. They don't cost you money. So let's take the green roof as an example. Now, it costs money to put a green roof on top of a truck plant, but it actually will save us many times the, the cost of, of putting it on there. It will double the useful life of the roof. Uh, because it will protect the roof from uh, UV degradation, which causes leaks. Uh, Re-roofing a 10 and a half acre roof is a several million dollar job, so it will save us money there. It saves us money on heating and cooling costs because it insulates the plant from the extremes of hot and cold. Uh, and it saves us money in regulatory costs because it absorbs storm water that we would otherwise have to take to a chemical treatment plant before we could uh, discharge it to the nearby river. Instead, we're letting nature do what nature does. That stormwater today is now absorbed in the green roof and it is naturally filtered before it ever gets to the Rouge River. Um, so it's saving us really millions of dollars as opposed to costing us anything. And that's just one example. If utopianism is profitable business, then I guess this is utopian. That's what's inspirational about it. I mean, the, the world's full of dreamers. Uh, you know, I don't have any time for dreamers. Uh, I have time for people that are inspirational and have thought through uh, the, the, the real issues that you have to deal with as a business and have developed a, uh, a formula to successfully navigate that challenge. Ford heeft McDonough and Brongard ook betrokken bij de ontwikkeling van een compleet nieuwe auto. Een auto op waterstof met stoelen gevuld met sojaschuim en banden van maisplastic. De auto moet geheel bestaan uit biologisch afbreekbare materialen... of uit technische materialen die weer grondstof kunnen worden. In the business future, I can imagine, that vehicle has a value in the future. Its components can be reused, either uh, reconfigured to a different kind of vehicle or reapplied in some other business, maybe not our business. Uh, that is not how vehicles are built today. I build you a vehicle, I hope it lasts a few years. After a few years, you know, you and I have to figure out what we're going to do with that vehicle. We're probably going to send it to a scrapyard or a landfill or something of that nature. Uh, so it has no value. And I have to go out and buy more stuff and build another new vehicle. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me. I think we ought... There's a lot of valuable stuff in there. You know, there was a, a statistic that we found when we were looking at the Rouge project. Today, it takes 50,000 pounds of raw materials to make a 3,000 pound car. That's a lot of waste. And we can change that. Why don't we use 3,000 pounds of material to build a 3,000 pound car? It'll cost an awful lot less. There'll be a lot less environmental problems. I'll be happy, my customer will be happy. I think this is a philosophy that is going to affect every industry. And we're going to, by the way, make a lot of money on this. Uh, you know, th this, is, this makes business sense. And that's the most, one of the things that uh, most impressed me about Bill and Michael. I've, I've listened to any number of uh, thinkers and writers on the subject of sustainability, which is often described, as you know, as the triple bottom line of social, environmental, and, and economic performance. But almost every one of them, after they articulate that triple bottom line, talk exclusively about the environmental component. A few talk about the social component. Almost none of them have bothered to figure out how to make business sense out of sustainability. That's what is unique about Bill and Michael. 2006. In Hotel Peking vindt een ontmoeting plaats tussen een Amerikaanse delegatie en afgevaardigden van het Chinese bedrijfsleven en de overheid. 
De bijeenkomst is achter gesloten deuren en mag alleen gefilmd worden door de Chinese staatstelevisie. China and the United States will continue to work together to promote rural development through technological cooperation. Government officials, entrepreneurs and scholars from the two countries have praised the efforts made in water safety, energy saving and waste disposal. Bij de bijeenkomst is ook Madame Deng Nan, dochter van de vroegere Chinese president Deng Xiaoping. Het onderwerp, het uitwerken van de ideeën van McDonough en Brangard. China's new countryside development is a state-initiated project aimed at increasing overall agricultural productivity, building a harmonious society and reducing disparities between urban and rural areas. And that's it for this edition of China Today. Stay tuned for a weather forecast. I'm Zhang Ling. From me and all of the team here in Beijing, thanks for watching and bye for now. Uh, China is looking very hard at environmental issues because they're in a complete crisis. There. I mean, so they have all of the different situations of human experience. They have the most destructive events going on, and they have some of the most hopeful events going on, and the entire range in between. So the president of China has called for a circular economy, and as part of that call for a circular economy, it calls for cradle-to-cradle -cradle thinking. It's national policy and the new five-year plan. It means that materials are in closed cycles, and that come back, and that uh, we waste equals food, and that systems are designed so that they're safe and healthy and, and uh, circle in the economy and come back and go out and come back and go out. And that the people are, are fed and the soils are kept and the, the economy can continue because the materials and energy are in closed cycles. So it means renewable energy, it means safe materials, it means new production process. Madame Deng Nan is verbonden aan het Chinese ministerie van Wetenschap en Technologie. Zij kent McDonough maar al te goed. En de Chinese president Yin Tao is een fan van Brangard en McDonough. Hun boek is inmiddels het Chinese handboek voor de circulaire economie geworden. De Amerikaanse delegatie is onderweg van Peking naar het dorpje Huangbayou. Daar moet de feestelijke opening plaatsvinden van een aantal modelhuizen die ontworpen zijn door McDonald en Brangard. En zijn gebouwd met goedkope, volledig recyclebare materialen. China represents one of the biggest issues in the world today, because 400 miljoen people will be in new housing in the next 12 years. That would be like rebuilding the entire infrastructure of housing in the United States in seven years. That's how big this is. And if they used brick to build it, which is their conventional building material, they would need to destroy their soils, probably 25% of their farmland, and burn a lot of coal to fire the brick. So we have two projects types that we're doing right now uh, at scale. One is six new cities uh, developing master plan, conceptual master plans for cradle to cradle cities. And the other is developing new building materials, like this one over here, to, to build the cities without using brick um, and highly insulated, uh, low embodied energy, uh, low energy use uh, technique. Het bouwmateriaal van de experimentele huizen in Huang Bayou bestaat uit twee lagen geperst stand of ander fijn materiaal gemengd met een sterk bindmiddel. Dat vervangt bakstenen of beton. Daartussen zit geperst stro of een herbruikbaar soort piepschuim. Binnen simpele luxe. Geschatte bouwkosten zo'n 6000 euro. Een bedrag dat voor de platteland Chinees op te brengen zou moeten zijn, denkt men. Ja. 
Is het te duur? Nou, voor onze boeren valt het nu wel mee. Um, als we zelf een nieuw huis bouwen, kost het zo'n 60.000 tot 70.000 yuan. En ik vind dit nieuwe huis goed. Dus je vindt het niet te duur. Voor gewone mensen is het te duur, maar hoeveel het trouwens precies gaat kosten, weten we nog niet. Dat is uh, nog niet bekend. Overigens zijn de tuinmuren nog gewoon van gasbeton. En de tuintjes zijn klein voor de bewoners die gewend zijn hun eigen voedsel in de tuin te verbouwen. De huizen zijn slechts het experimentele begin van een groot Chinees avontuur. Er staan namelijk complete cradle-to-cradle -cradle steden op het programma. Well, China in its last two five-year plans was focused on industrialization and the building of its cities to take the rural population that was moving to the cities and to industrialize and develop its market economy. So we're doing these demonstration projects, for example, here in uh, Jinan. This is taking a degraded site that has been downwind of various things that have polluted it and then rebuilding that site into an eco-city here. Now, the, the idea of restoring the landscape is critical because if they're going to lose all their farmland by urban development, then our cities where we look at trying to put the farms on the roofs say, let's res reserve and preserve our farmland because we're going to need it for a healthy, uh, thriving population. But even in villages, we're looking at the idea that uh, in the next five-year plan, the idea is to develop the villages in a way that people don't want to leave. And so we're looking at how to build sustainable housing, sustainable enterprises, grow fuels, uh, develop new kinds of agriculture that allow people to stay and thrive on the villages instead of having to go to the cities. I think China is very worried that with this massive migration, 700 million people in the villages, seven to 800 million, uh, if the, of them, if 400 million go to the cities, they're afraid they won't find jobs in the future, and then we'll get slums. And if we get slums, we get social unrest. The other problem is, as the cities expand into the countryside, the farmers are concerned their land is being taken for the new development, and so there's civil unrest among the peasants. So any government formed by a peasant uprising has to get worried when the peasants are upset. So that's the part of the new model. De Chinese revolutie heeft een nieuwe wending genomen. De gedachte dat afval voedsel kan zijn, wordt begrepen door grote landen en grote bedrijven. Als de gedachte nu ook nog bij de consument terechtkomt, dan kan de revolutie beginnen. We have the opportunity now. We have now smart designers, young scientists, and it's time just to reinvent everything. And everybody can do his, his own work. He can go to the supermarket and can say, hey, can I compost it? Can I burn it without a filter? Yeah. Or do you take it back? Yeah. And it's only the society is so complex that everybody who does this generates so much momentum yeah, to change, make changes that, that even 5% can make changes. I talked to Mikhail Gorbachev about perestroika and glasnost. Yeah? And Mikhail Gorbachev said, look, we only had about 5% of the Communist Party. Yeah? Everybody else didn't understand what we were doing. But 5% really understood this and they made a change. Yeah? And they could destroy the whole totalitarian regime. We don't have a totalitarian regime. We have democracy. We can do things. Yeah? So it's not dangerous for us. Yeah? We can just reinvent everything in a free society. Yeah? And it's time to do this. Informatie, het lidmaatschap op onze wekelijkse nieuwsbrief en reacties surft u naar tegenlicht.wpro.nl.